hills and Naga hills and occupying tribal lands to stop the white men and their companions. This uh, inner line regulations were permitted. However, despite the, the missionaries were given special permission, and initially it was the British Baptist missionaries who uh, entered, and after that, the Wales Presbyterian missionaries had entered the Lushai Hills in their working. Now, here's something important was happening. When the missionaries, missionaries were propagating in London that Mary Winchester's kidnap was a providential event because it was God's way of bringing the missionaries into Lushai Hills. See, meaning that if, if, if Mary Winchester was not kid, kidnapped, the missionaries would not enter Lushai Hills and therefore Christianity would not have entered Lushai Hills. In that sense, it's a divine intervention. Divine intervention, it is God's will that, in fact, some of the missionaries even quoted Bible that in Bible, in the, in, uh, somewhere in Bible it is mentioned, the little girl will lead the way. So they interpreted it saying it is this Mary Winchester who had been kidnapped and since she was taken in, other missionaries entered and that is that has, that has brought changes in Mizoram. People are accepting Christianity and people are becoming Christian. They are giving up their ways, headhunting ways, they are giving up raiding, they are giving up kidnapping and they are becoming sober human beings, civilized human beings. Uh, this is very important. This is a campaign by the missionaries that the tribals were savages, they are barbarians, they are kidnappers, they are headhunters and they are slave drivers. And Mary Winchester's episode proves that. And Mary Winchester herself was confirming this story because whenever, despite being a very, very celebrity in, in, in Lushai society, she whenever there was a small meeting about India, about the tribals, about, uh, uh, about uh, uh, primitive people, also, and also, she would sneak into this meeting and they will, she will go there and like the meeting I mentioned earlier, she would stand there and say that, the person who was kidnapped, I am that person. I was that person who was kidnapped. I am. Um, I was about to be, you know, killed. I, I was, you know, I could have become a concubine or a white slave of the British, and if I was not rescued. Now there was a kind of narcissism in Mary, Mary Winchester's uh, propagation. She wanted to show that, on the one hand, she was trying to say the Lushais were indeed savage people, they kidnapped people, they were headhunters. And the other hand, she was sh showing that, that she survived all that to, to, to be alive today. And she's working to remove, uh, to remove the, um, uh, those features of in those, those, those society. Uh, in fact, if you just a diversion from here, this is a very, very common practice in 19th century and early 20th century Europe. A lot of uh, Europeans, both secular and ecclesiastical, meaning the missionaries, they would come to Northeast India or other parts of India, even in, in, in Africa, they will live among the tribals. They'll collect mementos and photographs, photographs, and go back and hold exhibitions of them. In fact, the first exhibition was held in 1858. Since then, these exhibitions were held to show the to, sh to show what savagery is, how savage people look like, how headhunters look like how kid, um, slave divers looked like and uh, these photographs and these exhibitions by these they were earning money sometimes these some of these mementos that actually were fabricated they were not actual thing similarly 
similarly if you see in the 19th century there are a lot of photographic exhibitions in for example Q, uh, Führer Hemendorf's one, Kaufman's ones, then there is Ursula Graham Bauer, there is J. H. Hutton, W. B. Smith, J. P. Mills, and Samuel Pyrin, Rose Pyrin, all these missionaries as well as anthropologists who worked among the tribes, they are going back to Europe and America traveling, holding exhibitions, and showing the mementos of these tribal people, telling the people this is what tribals look like, this is what tribals wear. And this is what tribals do. And this, what I'm trying to say, there is a sustained campaign about tribalism, about savagery, about headhunting. And where they are, this, this exhibition was also held, especially in the British Museum, British Museum. That, that there were the, the, the story of evolution, when, because this is the time when Darwin, Darwinian theory of evolution was making a very forceful impact uh, in the meeting. They were showing that this is the physical evidence how human beings evolved from primitive tribalism to today's man, to civilized man. So they are showing these photographs and mementos and proving that this is how the human evolution have taken place. In fact, in one such act, in Calcutta, one British officer, his uh, <clears throat> name was Dalton, he was about to, or he had organized an exhibition of exhibition of live tribals of Northeast India. He had collected some tribals from Arunachal Pradesh, from Naga Hills and Lushai Hills, and he arranged them to be transported to Calcutta, where can people can physically show what a tribal was what a tribal was, but unfortunately then the government objected because he said if if we do it and if one of the tribals died, then there will be a lot of problem. There will be a lot of international pressure. So it was given up, but the idea remained. This was going on throughout, in, throughout Europe and America and in the big cities of Calcutta, Delhi and, and Mumbai, where these exhibitions are held, this kind of talks were held to show what tribalism was, what tribal people looked like. In fact, Il, I would like to say this, there was an obsession with the idea that tribals are naked people. Now, when, you know, they had pr presented photographs where tribals, both Nagas and Lushais were shown basically bare body. They're not really naked. They had their clothes to cover their waist and thing. But their bare body, but why there was this obsession about nakedness of the tribal? You will notice that the tribal, the, these ethnographers who were talking about tribals being naked, were actually also showing and taking pieces of Naga shawl, for example, Lushai uh, Puane, for example, which the tribals were weaving. They're taking them and giving them an exemplary exhibitions of tribal craftsmanship. Now, why they could not connect that if the Naga and the Lushai people can weave such beautiful clothes, why they are not wearing them? They are not wearing them mainly because it was not necessary. They were poor people working in the fields and the climate of Northeast India was such, it's a tropical country, it's not Europe, that they needed, they needed clothing. They are fully covered, but yet they were presented as naked people. One glorious example was that Führer Hemendorf, who worked among the Nagas in the 1930s, wrote a book called The Naked Nagas. Now, just see, if you see his book, you will not find, he has given a lot of photographs, you will not find a single photograph where Naga is shown as a, not, uh, uh, as a naked Naga, either man or woman. Similarly, he, there is no description of Naga, but in his preface he mentions that he has already come to Northeast India with the idea that he will be writing about naked people. And the person who uh, he, uh, when he was in Banaras, Banaras, the people, one of the Brahmins he met, he said, we have naked people amongst ourselves. Means he said, we have Naga sannyasis, Naga sadhus. They are completely naked. Are you going to write about them? 
Bhemendra said, no, no, I'm not going to write away. I'm going to talk about the Nagas of Northeast India, who are also naked. But actually, Naga peoples are not naked. Same, same Führer Hendergraf, when he goes back, he was, uh, he was arrested for spying during the Second World War. Then he comes back in the 1960s to Nagaland and Arunachal Pradesh and writes another book. So 30s, he found Nagas to be naked. In the 60s, he's come back. Do you think in 60s, any Naga was naked? Even if, assuming they were naked in the 1930s, in the 1960s, missionary influence, the influence of the government of India, everybody was dressed more like an European, if not anything else, with uh, suits and coats and pants. In, yet, yet, uh, the book that he wrote, a sequel to his first book, Naked Nagas, he called it, he entitled it, saying that it is Return to the Naked Nagas. Means he did not mention that now Nagas are not naked. He continues. So this harping of nakedness is part of this, this um, campaign that the tribals of Northeast India are savages, they are barbarians, they are headhunters, they are slave dealers. Nakedness was a part of There is this whole construction of savagery, this whole construction of prim primitive people. And these are features of primitiveness, features of uh, savagery, which they constructed by their mementos, by pictures, by photographs, and by, uh, by campaigning. Now I move to the continuation of the story that I st started with Mary Winchester's story. In 1908, Another missionary whose name was Peter Fraser, who had visited Northeast in Lusha Hills, and he was trying to convert people. And when he was trying to convert people, he found that it was not easy to convert some people who were, who were not free people. In other words, meaning that they, they, he found that they are slaves to the chiefs. And because they are slaves, they do not have right to their own life and therefore they could not con convert. They could be converted only by releasing them, liberating them from their serfdom, uh, liberating them from their uh, slavery. So initially he used to pay, there was a, uh, there was a custom that if you could pay uh, 40 rupees to the chief who owned the slave, then he can secure his liberation and then he can be converted. But for one man, it was not possible to liberate so many people. So he, it struck him that slavery was prohibited in British Empire in 1840. And how is it that it is continuing in Lushai Hills even now? So he wrote to the British authorities in Lushai Hills that Lushai, Lushai, uh, slavery is prohibited everywhere. It is banned by the government. How is it continuing, you abolish it immediately. Now, the, the administration in Lushai Hills, they did not want to interfere in the affairs of the Lushai because whenever, after 1857, whenever there was, a, there was an idea of non-intervention that you can intervene in their economic and political life, do not intervene in the cultural life of the people of India, because whenever they have done so, there were rebellion. And Lushai being in a very disturbed area, entire Northeast India was a frontier zone. There are frequent tribal, uh, tribal rebellions. And therefore, uh, they refrained from abolition. They came out a counter argu argument that if you, uh, what you say is slavery is not slavery at all. It is a kind of an institution, a social institution of the Lushais where people surrendered themselves to a, to the chiefs, some poor people who doesn't have their own uh, subsistence, doesn't have their own means to sustain themselves, look after themselves, just surrender to the chief and chief look after them. So they, it is not slavery. It is just dependence. It is a kind of bondedness, which is benign, which, which cannot be compared with the slavery because, and therefore it, it need not be, abolish, there is no need to abolish. But Peter Fraser was adamant. He, 
he, he insisted that slavery should be abolished. And when he insisted, the British government threw him out of Lushai Hills. He was expelled from Lushai Hills. But Fraser did not stop. When he went back to England, he was a very powerful man. Though he's a missionary, he was a doctor. He was a political person. He was very close to the a person named Lloyd George, who later on became the British Prime Minister. They were close friends. And through Lloyd George, he pressurized the British government in London that this practice in Lushai Hill should be halted, should be stopped. Now, the issue was raised in the British Parliament twice. The government was pressurized that we, there is a report that there is slavery going on in one part of our empire, that is Lushai Hills. Why, when the rest of the world, we have abolished uh, slavery, how it is continuing in Lushai Hills? There, the minister replied, the secretary of the state replied, same as the, as the Lushai Hill administration, that there is, it is not slavery, it is a benign dependence, which is part of the Lushai customs, it is not at all slavery. When, when this was done the, in the parliament, when the British replied that it is not slavery and therefore it need not be uh, uh, abolished, Mary Winchester, who was then in London, sent a long letter, long memorandum to the British minister, saying that in the parliament you have lied, you have said there is no, no slavery in Lushai Hills, and it is a benign form of dependence. That there is slavery in slavery in Lushai Hills. I am the living example. I'm the li li living example of slavery in Lushai Hills. I was I'm Mary Winchester. I was kidnapped by the Lushai in 1971. I was about to be converted to a slavery. I would have become a white slave of the Lushai if the British had not rescued. And how do you say there was no slave no slavery? Uh, <clears throat> however. The matter then went to the League of Nations. Uh, there also it was discussed the Lushai slavery, the slavery in, in, in Naga Hills. The British government said in certain part of the of India, India, such forms of bonded labor is there. It is not slavery. So in the as you know, in 1926, the League of Nations slavery was completely abolished throughout the world. But concessions were made from for these parts, Lushai Hills, uh, uh, Nefa, then known as Nefa, present Arunachal, and Naga Hills, that these are part of their culture. This is not slavery. This is a form of benign bondedness. Therefore, it is allowed to allowed to continue. Now, I come to the other part uh, of thing that since then, since this campaign. Whatever work have been done, Lushais and Nagas and some of the Onochil have been have been branded as headhunters. They have known as headhunters, right from he Hutton, Smith, you know, <clears throat> J.P. Mills, Shakespeare, all these ethnographers who wrote about the various tribes. You know, all of them hampered on the idea that these tribes were headhunters. They had various form of slavery among them, and they were basically naked people, but my I, my uh, question is, my interrogation is, how such an idea continued right from the colonial period till the present present day that these tribes are headhunters, are, are slave drivers? How how did the people themselves internalize? Why there is no interrogation from the people themselves from the Nagas, from the Lushais, from the Indian historians, interrogate that this ethnography that was conducted by the colonial anthropologists, how does it perpetuate even now? I have found that, you know, uh, in, in Nagaland, if you go to Kohima, there is a state museum, there is a skull kept there. A skull cap there, and it is said this is a symbol of Naga head hunting. That Nagas were one head hunters. This is this is the specimen of that hunted head. Uh, similarly, 
there is a series there is a bbc series called table in the himalayas by michael pally he showed he comes to nagaland he shows nagas as head done head hunters in hindustan times few years back there was a there was a series by one journalist named anu malhotra who shows that nagas were head hunters and at kunyak nagas for example even even now they continue uh, commit uh, head hunting even now they continue the practice uh, there is a, a short film which has been shown in the kans film festival by a naga himself who has made a film on naga head hunting so how is it that the idea that nagas were head hunters which was actually started by the colonial anthropologists like hutton and mills and smith continue even now how do we believe heavy ever question now i uh, i started with this if nagas were head hunters they would have had hunted head even before the british came so the nagas have their the only plain people they have around them are the assamis that is brahmaputra valley so nagas and the assamis have a long standing relationship of almost thousands of years nagas did not write their own history but ahoms did they have the ahom burunjis ahom burunjis were written right from the 13th century till the 19th centuries now uh, there are many burunjis most of burunjis are available in english the the easiest way to understand the naga head hunting uh, find reference to naga head hunting is to check those burunjis i for example have checked the burunjis right from the 13th century first burunjis to the thing i that in the 700 years of ahom naga relationship there was just one case of head hunting on the other hand if you go to the lushai hills lushais were in the frontier of bengal lushais did not write but bengalis have their own history about their frontier people they have written about those days uh, the bengali medieval chronicle doesn't mention lushais they mention cookies for those days kukai kuki and lushai lushai are the same people they have mentioned they have mentioned the kuki used to come down they used to raid occasional raids and they were fine with it occasional raids were there and they understood in those raids some people got killed but they were not head, they were not known as head hunters they used to come down to the plains kill some people and kidnap people back to the things this is understandable because these tribal economies were very very manpower short if you read james scott's art of not being governed this is very very elaborately discussed theoretically discussed that why kidnapping and kidnapping of people from the plains to the hills was necessary it was the nature of that economy and scott calls it the reverse movement to the is he calls it a reverse conveyor belt in the airport you see conveyor belt for where baggages come from this side to that side and we pick up or he said it's a reverse curve from the plains it goes to the hills it's a reverse movement of human beings this labor is necessary to sustain the economy the jhum cultivation for example of the tribal because of the shortage of manpower and both nagas and lushais preferred women than men to be kidnapped because once they are kidnapped then they can because through women they they can have reproduce more men and increase their demographic strength among the lushais for example it's not that they did not have slavery there are two categories of slavery one is called the captive slavery other is called the non captive captive means people captive who slave slaves who were procured from other tribal groups from the plains or from other tribal groups they are captive among them were the champsen slaves they were basically uh, uh, they are captured kept within their uh, sometimes they sold to other tribes there are non captive slaves who are their own people the poorer people the poverty stricken people or the physically handicapped people who cannot look after themselves who cannot procure food for themselves they surrender to the chief and in return for food they work for the for the chief 
and the relationship is this this group of uh, non captive captive slaves are not called slaves they are called boys b o i boy basically meaning retainer or poverty stricken people who have surrendered uh, for for slave they have different word called sal sal s a l sal but with the coming of the british the sal had completely disappeared this non captive captive slaves have disappeared non captive boys were there so slavery was there it is not that slavery was not there but they had declined similarly head hunting the way in between the ahoms and the and the nagas there is no record of any hand hunting in 700 years similarly between the bengal and the lushai relationship there is not a single incidence reference that the cookies had had hunting among the tribal there are reference to raiding and kidnapping and in fact they said the cookies would normally come down during the market days to the plains in the duar market in the foothills market they buy things exchange things they bring their things from the hills like ivory rubber all these some herbs and take their things one important item of exchange was salt the the medieval bengali literature mention that uh, one favorite item the cookies procured from the fields was the those those were called photo chitros meaning the pictures of gods and goddesses that uh, that bengali painters used to uh, um, used to paint uh, for taking people for puja purposes for prayer purposes and a mirror these small mirrors that were available the british in these were common were in the in the uh, uh, items of exchange so what i am saying if nagas and lushais were head hunters there would be reference but there was no reference that means if at all there are references it, if at all there are head hunting it would have started from the british period in the british period what i find heads the both nagas and lushais did collect heads now there is a very very important difference between collecting heads and head hunting heads hunting heads makes you ferocious ferocious it makes you are targeting heads for collection i am targeting killing people for heads but here collecting heads means when you kill a people as a trophy as an evidence you take so they are they can be called head collectors not head hunters this is a subtle subtle difference because head hunting as a practice are there in some parts of southeast asia which is a which is a different practice at all so why why this was not a question and why there was head hunting in the british period in the british period we do see some chiefs were uh, were collecting a lot of heads why the if you see the reason you find that the british dependent they were dependent on the chiefs for ruling these areas because here colonial state was not very 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 rooted they did not want strong administration in lushai hills and nagar hills because of the nature of the terrain because of the frontier and nature of the terrain because of the nature of the people very rebellious people in fact there were just in both nagaland and lushai there were two british officers there was no police one battalion of assam rifles in nagaland another battalion of assam rifles in 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 mm, lushai hills so there were no police so the british administration ruling through the chiefs so who would become the chief so chief was one who was warrior who was powerful who was looked up by the common people and therefore they feel those who those who have more heads could be a chief and therefore in the british period from the especially from the 1929 there very famous raid by gp mills that there were there were competition among the chiefs to collect more heads so there are you'll find in the british period there are, there were there was increase in the nature of tribal feuds inter tribal feuds and killing of people and collection of heads this is because through collection of heads a chief could become a chief and uh, and become a favorite with the british administration so there were no head hunting there were head collections and this head collections was had increased during the british time only because the british had encouraged them 
The third part, the, the campaign. Now, why did the tribal themselves believe that they were headhunters? Why did not they question this, this questionable description of themselves? You find that, as I said, in Naga Hills, in, 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 in Kohima, in the museum itself, there is a head cap showing as a specimen of Naga head. If you enter Lushai Hills, one of the first thing you'll notice is there is Assam Rifles office where there is something written that headhunt. There is a long uh, uh, signboard showing, calling it headhunters den. It is actually bar where the Assam of Assam Rifles officers go and drink. Headhunter headhunters den. Now, uh, similarly. A number of missionaries, the indigenous mission, not white missionaries, the Indians, they were, they call them, they now write books called Headhunters to Soul Head Hunters. Another book is called From Headhunters to Church Planters. It, it, these books are not only claiming, confirming their headhunters, but also show, also claiming that they have transformed. They have transformed from headhunters to soul hunters. Uh, to, to church planters. Uh, <clears throat> in other words, what I'm saying, the tribal themselves has had internalized the idea that they are headhunters and they are church planters and they have transformed. This, this campaign regarding, regarding colonized people being tribal and headhunters is nothing new. There are very important examples. For example, you'll you might have, if you read Subhash Chandra Bose's biography, you'll see there is a very famous incident that when he was studying in Presidency College, one of his professors, Richard Orton, had said that the Indians are actually apes, meaning that Europeans are not apes, they're human beings, but Indians are basically apes because of which Subhash Chandra Bose had beaten up Richard, uh, uh, Richard Orton, his professor, and he was expelled from the college. Similarly, if you re read Mahatma Gandhi's autobiography, you'll find Mahatma Gandhi, when he was in London, he had gone for studies. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi's pant was pulled down by his host because they wanted to see his tail. The idea was they all felt that Indians were all monkeys they had you know they had their forefathers were monkeys ancestors were monkeys and they they must be still holding the having the tails and his pant was pulled out to see the hell similarly tagore when he was he visited london in the 1880s ravidana tagore the nobel laureate he when he hosted some of the children in his uh, <clears throat> host house screamed that how can you uh, Call such a blackie in our house. Rabindranath Tagore was called a blackie. Thirdly, when uh, when Fizo, the Naga leader, he lived in London, his his host had taken him to house. The two maid servants of the house screamed, said, a "Headhunters had, had entered our house." It is there in Fizo's biography, written by an Englishman himself, had, and one of them had fainted. And they, after that, they left the house. They said they would not work as domestic servant in their house because there is a headhunter living among them. So it is not that only Lushais and Nagas are called headhunters. The people, I mean, with people like Subhash Chandra Bose, people like Tagore, people like Mahatma Gandhi, Padma uh, Gandhi, were also called that their ancestors were, were monkeys, apes. In fact, as recently, as in the 1930s, Mahatma Gandhi, if you remember, was called a naked fakir by Churchill. I mean, naked. So this, by doing this, such kind of, by branding, this is not, a, these are not innocuous, in, innocent branding of Indians. It is not, not there only with Nagas or Lushais. It was done with other Indians or other Africans as well. This was very common, and the uh, and the sad part of it is that we have internalized it. You know, there is an evidence that in Lushai Hills, 
I have referred to the incident of Alexander Poor in 1871, that when James Ingester was killed in a tea garden through a raid and his daughter was kidnapped. In the 1930s, missionaries used to say that your forefathers were headhunters. They have committed sin by killing people, headhunting. So the, 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 the missionaries used to take their students, school students, in a group, bring them to Kachar in the Alexander Porti estate and make them, uh, make them repent to, on the site where James Winchester was killed. Repent for their mistake, past misdeeds of their, of their forefathers. In fact, on the site where James Winchester was called, there is a church. Church has been built by the Mizos as a penance. And every year in, in January, when the day when James Winchester was called, this, there is a pilgrimage from the Lushai Hills. The Mizos go there in, and go there pray in that church as a penance for the, for the misdeeds, for the sins of their forefathers. So this way, the missionaries, the white men were not only constructing, not only constructing savagery for the, for the tribals of Northeast, Northeast India, calling them tribals and making them actually believe in them, making them internalize the idea. And the unfortunate part of it is that the tribals themselves, Nagas themselves believe that they are headhunters, the Lushai themselves believe they are slave drivers, and they they this colonial ethnography. Remember, ethnography and anthropology were two subjects which was not there before the colonial period. Is a result of this inter encounter between the white man and the tribal that a new subject called ethnography and anthropology has come up. If you read Taladasa's works, he said. Anthropology is the handmaiden of colonialism. So through this handmaiden, through this handmaiden, through this subject called and, uh, anthropology and ethnography, colonial anthropographers has constructed an identity for the tribals themselves. And unfortunately, without interrogating, with the, without questioning those constructions, the tribals themselves, we all continue to perpetuate these myths that tribals especially the Nagas, the Arunachalis and the Lushais were headhunters, they were slave, dri slave drivers. And that is way a new history. We See, ethnography is not history. Anthropology is not history. But we have accepted this ethnography. We have accepted this anthropology as history. And as historian, we continue to perpetuate this myth. It is high time that, therefore, we should any work in Naga Hills or Lushai Hills or, or, or uh, Arunachal Pradesh should start with first questioning this work of Mills, Hunter and Smith and Shakespeare and Perry. Question these ethnographic notes, rewrite them. And that should be the beginning of new history. Otherwise, this history, of history that has been given to the people of this Northeast India, this is a history of, of, of Nagas where there are no Nagas. This is the history of the Mizos, which where there are no Mizos. It's a history constructed by the white people for the Nagas, for the Mizos. And unless the Nagas and Mizos interrogate them and reject this history, there would not be a correct history for these people. Thank you. I think it's time that uh, I complete. It's almost more than an hour. Thank you. If there is any questions, uh, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, sir. You yeah. have given us the insight into the topic. It was really, really informative. Now, we will have a time for discussion. I request Dr. Tamjin Wapang to uh, facilitate the discussion. Over to you, sir. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Atani. And thank you, Professor Nag, for the very insightful discussion. Okay, the first question is from uh, Robin Tamsa, Sir Robin Tamsa, and he says, 
what are the ideological differences between the missionaries, anthropologists, and the colonial administrators? Uh, <clears throat> ideology is, of course, uh, ideologically three. All three are different. Ideological differences are there. Uh, <clears throat> missionary ideology is to is to propagate Christianity, and colonial ideology is to perpetuate their empire. And anthropologists, of course, is to construct the history and culture anthropological account. Now, now this is there is these are divergent. There is no way to saying that colonial administration and missionaries were hand in gloves. No, no, it is not. Correct. In fact, most of the time, the missionaries and the administration were fighting with each other. Both mission administration and British. Uh, in Naga Hills and Rishai well, actually were hateful towards the missionaries because they did not want missionaries there, but because of the circumstances they were, uh, they had to bear them out. The, the, the administration believed that missionaries were too interfering. They want to completely change and transform the tribals which is not right because they the british felt if you want to transform them it will create rebellion among the tribals because they have from their experience they have seen that whenever the anybody has interfered in the culture of the tribals or by anybody for example there was rebellion so there was actually hostility between the tribal uh, between the missionaries and the and the administration they were uh, in fact the, uh, i mentioned in lushayus there is a conflict between between the missionaries and and the, and, the, and the administration and because of that the missionaries used to get some fund from the administration they had stopped that fund so that they and in fact they have expelled some of the missionaries so they are sometimes you might feel that missionaries and administration are heading they're, they're collaborating they're not collaborative actors. they're hostile to each other but they have they have to bear each other because of the compulsions of empire number two as far as anthropologists was concerned see most of the anthropologists are colonial administration themselves you take hutton you take it takes me you take uh, mills they're themselves so therefore the the ethnography they wrote was not for we use them for academic purpose it was not at all for uh, for academic purposes if there if you see the history of the establishment of the directorate of ethnography in assam because all these areas were in assam uh, they said it was first done in lushai hills uh, sorry in naga hills because they felt first these areas had to be demarcated for an effective administration, especially after the Konoma uprising. For effective administration, you first have to have data about these people. You must know who are the people really. Then you know what they like and what they do not like. So they have established the Directorate of Ethnography and they have they have asked all the administrators that please learn the language of the people. Right to what time, go inside the people and write there about them and if you publish them there was promotion there was an increment for them they were given money awards so that is why on Nagal so many books came out in Assam all the type books are because of the past this is an administrative initiative that if you write ethnography then we'll know the people and if we know the people we'll be able to govern them properly so now we read his Mill's book and Hutton's book as part of our history. It was not meant to be read like that. It was meant for the administrators. That on the basis of that you get to know people, and if you know that people well from these books, then you can rule them according to their requirement. So ideologically, they were all different, but the compulsions of colonialism was such that they worked together. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you so you. much. Yeah. Thank you, okay, sir. Professor Nag, mm -hmm. there is another question from Dr. Ritu Mathur from Calcutta. The question is, yeah. why did the Nagas collect hats? Please, can you share your idea? Yes, yes. Can you repeat? Why, why did the Nagas collect hats? Collect hats. Collect hats is a trophy. See, if 
if you do something, you need an evidence to show. See, for Nagas and Lucia, for the tribals to become the one of the chief achievement of life is becoming for men is a warrior. And how do you prove that you are a warrior? You you go to a, go to a war, fight battles, and those are battles fought in a different place. When you come back home. You have to show, you have to provide evidence that they have, that you have defeated somebody. So people who were killed in the war, their heads were collected and brought as evidence, as trophy. Remember, there was a time a, a woman would marry a warrior and, and he will marry a warrior only if he has collected sufficient head. So the head head was collected as trophy and evidence as simple as that there was no other deeper meaning in it another question by okay yeah uh, mary penny muli uh, she says she is asking uh, besides the burangis what sources should we look yeah. at to know or confirm that the nagas are not headhunters it is very simple you ask yourself, how do you how how do you uh, know if Nagas are headhunters? It, it cannot be that they started headhunting only when the British came. They must have been headhunting right from the ancient period when they emerged there. So, since Nagas did not write any history, how do we know? But Nagas did not had, uh, write history, but others wrote because Nagas did not hunt heads only among them. So they hunted heads. In the plain, most of the raids took place in the plain areas in the Brahmaputra Valley. And Brahmaputra Valley, we have the history of Brahmaputra Valley. And the Ahoms had the greatest, inter, uh, longest period of interaction with the Nagas. And Ahoms wrote history right from they have entered uh, Assam in the 13th century and till the 19th century. In this period, they have written a score of Burunjis. And these Burunjis are so detailed, so detailed that almost every day activity is there and they will find nagas and so much details of 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 the interaction of the of the ahoms with the nagas and in fact all nagas whenever they raided these places they visited these places every details was given the, to if you want a summary summary of this because maybe you cannot this some of these burangis are in thai language some of them are in assamese most of them have been translated into English, but one uh, English work based on these Burundis is a book by Lakshmi Devi. It's called Ahom Tribal Relationships. It is published by Guwahati University. It is available in Guwahati University for sale. You can see, look at that. You'll find that she has, Lakshmi Devi has studied the Ahom Tribal Relation right from the 13th century to the 19th century. And there is a chapter on the Ahom Naga relationship. If you read that chapter, that will give you enough insight and after that, if you're interested, of course, you can go into the original uh, um, Buranjis. So these Buranjis are available and works uh, works on the base, based on these Buranjis are also available, which show that the interaction between the Ahoms and Nagas. Because this side, Ahoms, Nagas were only with the with the Brahmavutra Valley. That side, it is only the Burmese. Burmese of course, you will not get any much writing, but from the Ahom side you get, and from that you can get a proper account, in fact, a detailed account of our Ahom Naga relationship. From there, you can understand whether there was any headhunting or not. Okay. Um, okay. Next is a very, very, um, I think it's a bit confusing. I hope uh, Zulu Jamir, if he is here, he will clarify on the question itself. Uh, he yeah. is asking, you mentioned about mm. James Scott returning to the tribals of the to the hills. James Scott returning to the tribals. Yeah. yeah. Do you think that scenario oh, yes. is repeated due to COVID nineteen? That's the question. Yeah, yeah. Can I, can I, can you please repeat it? Do you do you think that scenario is being repeated due to COVID nineteen? <laughs> yes, it's a very interesting question. Uh, perhaps so, we do not know enough of COVID-19 now, but yes, it is possible. This, 
it is coming it, it is a reverse copy as well you know so maybe maybe it is coming but uh, what james court says is that from the from the plain area there is a movement of tribals uh, a movement of human labor to the hills hmm. and you know maybe covin covin it's kind of reversing the same trend okay um i will consider this as the last set of questions uh, from our participant and this one is uh, from again uh, professor i think uh, dr ranjan kumar behera uh, and lano yeah. from i think meghalaya as well as thang swan hang so uh, the questions are similar yeah. and why i'm clubbing them together uh, most of the indians are called sure. Uh, have called Nagas as headhunters. Do you agree? That's the first question. Related to it is another question. If the Nagas were not headhunters, how did they acquire those heads? That is another question. And the next question will be, what is the difference between head hunting and head collection? So um, I yeah. think, yeah. 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 The first first as i say the rest of the indians except the assamese other indians did not have any interaction with the with the nagas but but the assamese did not call the nagas head hunters as i said in their uh, there is no mention of any head hunting they the word head hunting doesn't have an assamese equivalent the head hunting Head hunting does the concept. Head hunting doesn't have an equivalent, Indian equivalent. It's a it's a European concept, European construction of tribalism. Not just in not just in Nagaland or Northeast India, but in African context as well. So they do not have they do not consider if if any Nagas are placed and call in Nagas as head hunters. It is because the British called them. Of the colonial and the Polish court. Secondly, what is the uh, was it called the difference between head hunting and 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 uh, collecting? Is uh, it's very simple. As I said, head collecting is to show the trophy you have collected. So there are heads collected. A lot of Naga, especially in the Konya area, heads collected were exhibited. It is a nice position. These heads are not collected from live human being they were collected after from the enemies when they were killed in war or battles and as evidence as trophy the way if you win if you win the athletics in a game you show a medal it's a medal so don't see it as a you see it as a medal it's a trophy it's an evidence of your warriorship it's an evidence that you are you have defeated your enemy in the thing. So it has to be seen from this account. In the houses of the chiefs where there are a lot of heads, it just show how many heads he had collected. It said it means how many enemies he have defeated. And how these is these are his trophies, like when people go to war and when they come back from war, they show the medals. In fact, it recently in a I'll just give you one thing. During this border problem between India and China, India and Pakistan, a lot of time Indian soldiers were killed and their heads were chopped off. Do we call them headhunters? Do we call the Pakistani headhunters or when Indians kill the Pakistanis or Chinese and take their cut their heads, do we call them headhunters? We don't. Similarly, for similarly, the Nagas and Lushai also cannot be called headhunters. These are head collections, collections of trophies. So what I'm trying to say, there is a misrepresentation. The idea, why do they call headhunters? By trying to call them headhunters, they are trying to say these are barbarians, these are savage. That is the idea. And why they are savage? This is a this is a you know binary between civilization and uncivilization, civilization and barbarism. The question is that by calling somebody headhunters, what do the British gain? Simple. They gain 
They, they say they are headhunters, therefore they are primitive and savage. And therefore we have right to rule over them, to civilize them, white man's burden, which you have heard so much. This is a justification of the white rule over the non-European people in Asia and Africa. This is a justification. This is a justification of colonial rule. This is a legitimization of colonial rule. This is what the colonialism gained by calling branding people as headhunters and slave drivers. Okay. Uh, there are many questions, but uh, since time is very limited, we will stop yeah, yeah. our discussion here. I believe even Professor Nag is very thirsty now. I, yeah, Tamjan, you can share my email and other yes. contact details with the participants if anybody wants. I'll be very happy yeah. and glad to. Uh, reply to them, okay? Uh, yes, yes. Sir. Adani has my, all my details, contacts, so she can. Uh, so, uh, dear participants, thank you so much. Uh, before I hand over the time to Dr. Adani to wrap up this session, the, uh, I should say that this is a very, very fruitful and enlightening session for all of us. No. Okay, this is the first uh, online academic station uh, the department has organized and indeed it has turned out to very successful only because of you all. The Unity College and Department of History would like to sincerely thank everyone, especially um, Sir, a resource person, for giving time and enlightening us. We will uh, be continuing with our academic venture and therefore we look forward to see you all in the days to come. So it was such an amazing uh, session and thank you everyone. And like Sir has said, um, Dr. Tamjin Wapang has said, kindly uh, take care when you are, uh, be careful, you know, when you uh, fill the form because once you fill the form and uh, once you submit, like e-certificate will be generated and you will, uh, can download your certificate. So thank you all once again. And now you may leave the meeting and stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Adani. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, sir.